Hi, uh, good morning, uh, and uh, welcome to the next edition of uh, Question Hour from Sundaram Mutual Fund. Thank you again for the overwhelming response in terms of questions across the uh, social media channels that we've got. So I've got the list of questions with me. Uh, I'm Sunil Subramanian, Managing Director here, and I will attempt over the next uh, 45 minutes to an hour to answer as many of these questions as possible. Uh, I'll also leave some space for live questions, which uh, my team will uh, share with me and ask me during the course. So at the last 15 minutes, we'll devote for the live questions. So please do post your live questions as and when. And these may be questions which arise from the answers that I give to the questions that I've already posted. So the, broadly, the structure will be, I'll spend 15 minutes on the economy, 15 minutes on the markets, and 15 minutes on the investment side. That's the way we have uh, structured the questions that we have received from you all. And at the last 15 minutes, we could have questions across all the three segments. So the first question that we've received, which I'll be addressing, is as follows. As the US is facing a recession, what are the chances India will face a recession? Right. In context to that, they was what is the impact of the ongoing stagflation in India on the equity markets and also related to which sectors will perform in the rest of 2022 and in 2023? And what is the impact on investments in equities, particularly SIPs exposed largely to equities? Right. So the second part of the question are largely related to the markets. I'll address those when I do a broad market after 15 minutes. So first of all, let me answer the fundamental question that you've been asked, which is, the US is faces recession, what are the chances that India will face a recession? So I think that uh, we are far removed from a recession in India. The context to that is what is a recession? Recession is defined as two quarters of negative GDP growth. And as you've been seeing the GDP growth numbers from the US are hovering around one to 2%. So the chance of then slipping into negative territory is quite real and could happen. But India, we are running at a 6 to 7% GDP growth. And so for 6 to 7% to become negative GDP growth is quite a long journey and totally unsupported by the way our economic data is coming out. So I would say, you can rest assured that even though uh, the US and the maybe parts of Europe will go into a recession, uh, I do not expect India to go anywhere near what is called a recession. Then there's this word called stagflation, which is a also being used. So what is stagflation? So stagflation is a situation of stagnant growth and rising inflation. That's why the word stagflation was coined, right? Now that's a situation which is already present in the US because growth has been stagnating at the one and a half to two percent levels. But from a perspective of inflation, it's also been rising in the US. So it's correct to describe the situation in the US as a stagflation. But in India, we are not seeing that the growth is stagnating, albeit there is a marginal increase in growth on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis or on a Y or Y basis. So I would say that we are not in a position of stagnant growth. If anything, the rate of our growth may get impacted by the US recession, but I do not expect India to be a declining or a stagnant growth economy. That's number one. Second is the concept of rising inflation. In the US, the inflation is at 7 to 8% compared to a growth of 2%. So the inflation is four times that of the GDP growth rate. In India, the inflation is 6 to 7% at a retail level at a growth of 6 to 7%. So we are more or less matched. So the level of inflation prevalent in India, though in absolute single digit growth terms may be equal to the US's inflation growth, the GDP growth of India is three to four times as much as that of the US. So for India to be described as stagflation is again something that I think is not true, right? Yes, we are in a decent inflation. In fact, remember one thing that India as a country is a supply driven economy. The US is a demand driven economy. In a supply driven economy, some period of inflation is necessary for growth to be supported because manufacturers will not build capacity unless they see a rise in the prices of their finished products. So I would say this level of inflation is actually a healthy inflation in India and is supportive of the corporate sector, which is essentially listed in the capital market. So with that summary, I hope I've given an answer to that. The next related question on the economy is uh, uh, somebody asking whether the economy scenario translates into the market. I'll come to the markets in a little bit. And then the third question was, how will the government of India tackle the current account deficit? So the current account deficit, uh, remember, is actually 
a trade deficit plus invisibles, right? The invisibles are your flows coming in from the NRIs. The trade deficit, which is the main thing because we import oil, that's why India is traditionally a trade deficit country. That one month in the COVID period when imports collapsed was when we had a trade surplus. So from a current account deficit perspective, is India's GDP grows more, our deficit will widen. If India's GDP slows down, the deficit will narrow. So fundamentally, right, you've got to believe that if India is growing, the current account deficit is going to grow, right? Now, what is the implication of growth? The reason the current account deficit is viewed to be a concern is because FIIs have been pulling out money from India. So the invisibles part of our inflows, which balances the deficit from a balance of payments, that's the problem that's missing. Now, as far as uh, the government of India is concerned, there's very little they can do because you don't want to curb those imports which are fueling the India's growth story. So in by putting import duties is one way the GOI can control the deficit. They are unlikely to do that. Now, what about exports? They have to support exports, right? So that support to exports can come by releasing certain things. But actually, if you see in places like wheat, the government has actually banned the export of wheat. So the current account is a very hard thing to manage because it's closely linked to India's growth story. So I would say that uh, the Indian government's approach will be to allow a current account deficit to be naturally built up and not worry too much about it from a perspective of the uh, economy's growth because anything they do to hurt imports will hurt our economy right beyond this also remember that the price of oil is not in the government of india's control the price of imported commodities is not in government of india's control so it's a very limited thing that the government can do to actually do that so overall, the current account deficit, as I said, is actually correlated to India's growth. And I don't see the government taking very strong action or worrying about the current account deficit because growth is far more important than managing the deficit for a short period of time. Right. The third question here related to that is what will be the most critical global drivers that will impact the Indian economy in the near term? And what are the key parameters to keep watch for? So the critical global growth drivers. So if you look, Look at it, right? Indian economy is reasonably insulated from the world economy. Okay, that's number one. Number two is the fact is that India is trying to build a manufacturing leg to our economy through the CapEx cycle that the government has been promoting through infrastructure and all of that. Basically, because we would like to replace China as the primary manufacturing goods exporter to the Western world, right? So the PLI scheme, which the government has launched, all of that is meant to take advantage of the fact that China is facing pressure, both on the age of its workforce, the cost of its workforce, and, and, and other concerns, right? And India has an opportunity here. So I would say that if the global growth is going to slow down into a recession, the ability of uh, some of the PLI schemes to succeed quickly, because unless there's a booming growth there, the sector growth here will get affected. That's number one. But that being said, I would say that's also not too important because a lot of the uh, PLI scheme is basically focused on the import substitution by the Western world that is shifting their existing imports from China with imports from India. So even in a recession, the pressure on the Western world to reduce cost of their imports will be high. And that's where India's labor cost advantage over China will come to our aid. So I would say that the Indian CapEx story for the time being is actually driven by the government of India's CapEx expenditure, and hence that's not likely to get affected. The one sector which will get affected by a recession is the IT sector, because as you know, the IT sector is dependent on growth being good in the Western world. And if there is a recession in the Western world, naturally IT demand, so IT could get negatively impacted by the global growth impact, right? So moving on from that to the next question, some throw some light on the global crisis. Well, okay, let me give you a quick summary of why the global crisis is actually happening. So basically, it's been a three-part story, right? I think it started primarily with the fact that COVID led to a supply shock on the world economy and inflation spiked, but demand also collapsed because of the fact that people were at home not spending money in the Western world. Now, to boost those, the central bankers of the world, the Fed and the ECB, cut interest rates and pumped a lot of liquidity into the market. When they did that, some of it came and all the market, you saw gold prices, you saw stock market prices, you saw everything rose up because of the liquidity flush. But at the same time, that fueled inflation in the US. So the demand-led inflation came and enhanced the supply-side inflation. So the inflation became a worry. 
And when they were beginning to act on the inflation to control it, that's when the Russia-Ukraine crisis came upon, right? So the Russia-Ukraine crisis added another supply crisis because Russia supplies oil and Ukraine was supplying food to the rest of the world. So that supply set gave a further pick to inflation and inflation became so alarming that the Fed had to do a sharp interest rate hike. Now, when you hike interest rates, what happened? You're actually cooling down demand. So in a way, this recession is now man-made because we are actually forcing the Fed through its actions, is forcing the US economy into a recession because only by killing demand will you then kill the inflation on from the supply side as well as the demand side. So the situation around the world is that we are hurtling towards a recession. Uh, the opinion is divided on whether we will see a soft recession or a hard recession, because depending on how quickly the inflation cools down, we could actually see the Fed easing off on their rate hike and have a soft recession. So let's wait and watch for the action in the coming months on that front, right? So then another question on the economy is, is India heading towards a situation prevailing in Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Turkey? God sakes, no. Please not worry. Our country has a far better uh, foreign exchange reserve balance of almost $600 billion. Our economy is growing at 7 to 8% GDP. We have a large young population workforce able to work. We have the government of India supporting the CapEx cycle. So our economy in a far better state of management, both through the reforms of the government and the proactive actions of the RBI. So we are nowhere near facing the kind of crisis that the countries that you have mentioned in your question. So do not worry about that. Somebody asked me, how do you see coal pricing and MS scrap pricing in the next three months? I'm sorry, I, it's not something that we can predict over a three-month period. And I don't think there's anybody who has such a kind of a view. So pardon me if I skip this question on the next three months price on coal. Uh, levy of finance, export duty on export of iron ore and steel materials is beneficial or not respect of trade balancing. Well, of course, it's beneficial in terms of trade balancing because it helps to curb, right? When you put a duty in hike, it curbs that thing. So definitely from a trade balancing, it is beneficial. The final question on the economy that I've got is this, in this high inflation, high interest rate situation, which sectors are badly affected, which are going to get least affected? How can you allocate funds to buy mutual funds? So the mutual fund related question I've answered in the investment section, right? Which sectors are badly affected in a high inflation, high interest rate scenario is when you have inflation in India, the inflation is largely imported inflation, right? So the imported inflation comes from oil, and imported uh, uh, you know, iron ore and steel related commodities and uh, those kind of stuff. So naturally the sectors which use those are the ones get, get affected. So I would say that if you say an automobile sector and this sector, whichever uses imported oil and its derivatives are the one which gets affected. But that being said, I think you should be aware that steel prices and oil prices have all started correcting because of the recession. So the scenario that you see of a high inflation, high interest rate scenario, I think the high inflation will cool down over the coming months as the recession gets closer and becomes more real in the US, right? So with that, I want to round up the economy related questions. Let me move on to the market relation questions, right? So somebody asked the question saying, how does the monsoon affect the Indian markets, right? So the monsoon very strongly affects the Indian markets for the reason that uh, the monsoon, the India's labor force is largely in the farm. Uh, most of our people live there. Though the GDP contribution of agriculture is not great, the labor component of GDP is from the farming sector is very high. So it affects India's unemployment rate, which the market tracks. Second is from an RBI action perspective, right? A food inflation accounts for 47% of India's CPI basket. So the way food inflation behaves drives a lot of what the RBI in terms of the rate hike and liquidity pumping scenario, right? So the markets are very sensitive to liquidity and to raise hikes. And hence a bad monsoon means food will be short, means inflation will go high, means RBI may hike rates. And the reverse is true. If there's a good monsoon, food prices will ease, then RBI will not cut. So obviously a good monsoon monsoon is a favorable thing for the stock market and that's what all of us should pray for. How much more is the Nifty expected to fall? Your guess is as good as mine, right? So because the Nifty has largely fallen on the back of FIS selling and that's likely to continue as long as the Fed continues to hike rates, which means the dollar will get stronger, more money will flow into the US. So the dollar gets even strengthened, then the rupee weakens to weaken, then for a foreigner investing in India, he has to bear the risk of currency loss in addition to the cost of his capital going up. So I think that the fall of the Nifty essentially is a function of the interest rate hike in the US, which the coming weeks will tell. So how much more can it fall? Well, it depends on the FI ownership and which, as you know, is a very significant part of the Nifty. 
how long will the market be volatile well the market will be volatile until we actually come to heads up against the recession right if you know there's a slow recession versus a hard recession i think the markets will react accordingly but a hard recession will actually also move the fed from a liquidity tightening perspective which is quantitative tightening to quantitative easing so i would say that the volatility of the market will remain until there's clarity on the inflation scenario right so the us inflation is what we need to track how effective is the fed's interest rate hike in uh, uh, tackling the inflation so at least for the rest of the year at least till diwali i do expect the markets to remain volatile because we are unlikely until the winter comes into the us really get a sense of how the us economy is responding right so you asked the question on how was the market this year in 2023 this year will be a volatile market here 2023 i expect a strong economy uh, from india and i expect the markets also to follow suit so i think one can expect a good bounce back in the stock market over the year 2023 more uh, rear ended to the second half of 2023 the next question is in the last five years whenever nifty p is less than 20 the given a good return and since nifty p is less than 20 is a good time to invest well not necessarily from a nifty p perspective it's the fact is that is the earnings expectation of 20 going to be beaten by the markets so 20 is what everybody is already discounted right so if indian economy is p actually going to be better than 20 then the markets will do well if you ask me the that question in framed in that way my answer is yes there is a good time to invest in equities because the correction which has happened has largely been a liquidity related correction fundamental indian economic strength means and when market gets to sanity from a liquidity perspective you will see that the market will start respecting earnings second aspect is that the market is also increasingly being supported by domestic flows and domestic fund managers are much more clued on to the domestic economy so the fund allocations by domestic institutional investors whether it's insurance companies or mutual funds are more likely to be broad based and spread across the large mid and small and hence you will see that the outperformance of the market right will come to play in the uh, next year. a uh, year and two years as i said so to that extent yes it's a good time to invest in the market right and yes what you say about inflation coming down is the worst is over well from a perspective of inflation is the worst over for india keep in mind the monsoon monsoon has begun well it should also end well if that is true then yes you know i think we have seen the worst of inflation from india perspective because internationally recession will mean that oil prices will correct and commodity prices will correct so overall all of these are positive for indian inflation so with that we now move to the investment side of it people had asked in the economy also some investment related questions in terms of equities so basically the first question that is purely on the investment side is that a distributor is asking that we shall recommend a, to a client to invest in pure equity fund if he has a time horizon of at least how many years well if you had asked me about 6 months ago or a set minimum 5 years because the markets had risen a lot but given the recent correction in the markets to significant levels i would say at this point in time even in a 3 year perspective you should be able to get reasonably good returns from the stock market so it's a good time to invest with a 3 year at least perspective in your mind next question around that is what is your alpha expectation in the long run uh, not less than 10 years of a mid cap fund over large cap and and small cap over mid cap so uh, mid cap funds over large cap funds over a 10 year period i would expect at least a 300 to 350 basis points alpha over the large cap over a 10 year perspective right so i think that can be a reasonable expectation small cap over mid cap however keeping 10 years in mind it's not helpful i'll tell you why because small cap is much more cyclical as an index it goes through very rapid highs and very rapid falls in much shorter than 10 year cycle sometimes you have two cycles within 10 years sometimes you have a cycle for 5 to 7 years so in the case of small cap right i would say that if you set yourself a benchmark of say a 5% alpha over the mid cap right but whenever you reach that 5% alpha you must exit because that 5% alpha over the next period will then evaporate back down to a 1 or 2% alpha so just waiting for 10 years in a small cap fund doesn't mean that you're going to get more alpha than a mid cap fund the timing of entry and the timing of exit are both critical in the small cap which is a very cyclical index and hence i would say that you should look at it with certain goals in mind on what return expectations or or wealth creation expectations you have and when those goals are hit you should ruthlessly exit your position and not say that in another 2 years i'll get even better returns so that's the caution i would like you to exercise around the small cap space uh 
which sectors according to you are such that can be recommended to clients for small allocation, say 10% of their portfolio at any given point, irrespective of their valuation, and given that the client has more than 10 years of time frame in mind, right? So if you say, what I understand you saying is that I don't want to worry about what happens to the market. If I say I give 10% to this sector and not worry about it, will it give me a decent return over the 10-year period? With that understanding in mind, for me, the answer is the FMCG sector. Right. The reason being that the FMCG sector is dominated by large MNC companies or Indian uh, MNCs, so to speak, which have strong distribution and their business, FMCG business doesn't go up as much in a boom, but doesn't fall as much in a recession because fast moving consumer goods, hair oil, toothpaste, all of these have to be consumed given whatever the state of the economy. So there is a certain rate of growth of their EPS which can be given. Sometimes the market overestimates that, so the return comes down. Sometimes the market underestimates that, the return goes up. And sometimes in terms of volatility, it gives an element of safety to the markets. And most importantly, FIS always like FMGG companies, because partly because they're MNC, they understand the parent, and partly because of the same that they are recession proof. So in a 10-year time frame, with a 10% allocation, since you framed the question so specifically, I would recommend that you look at the FMCG sector as a place to park your money. It's not going to be your best return at any time, but it's not going to be your worst return at any time. That's the qualification I would like to give in my answer. Right Now, is this the right time for retail investors to enter mutual funds? There never is a wrong time for retail investors to enter mutual fund. The manner of entry and the time horizon are the key. If a retail investor maintains a five-year horizon and if he staggers his investment through SIPs or STPs into the market at any stage of the market, provided he has a five-year plus term horizon, he will have a good wealth creation opportunity. So there is never a wrong time for a retail investor. The manner of entry is the key. At this point in time, given the recent correction, I would say that even a little bit of a lump sum entry into the equity market markets is not a bad idea for a retail investor, right? Next, considering the global economic distress in the medium and long term, should retail investors continue with the investment in MFMG? Absolutely. The global economic distress, see, look at this this way, right? The COVID was the biggest economic distress. What happened? The markets reached lifetime high. So economic distress doesn't mean bad performance of market because in economic distress, central bankers release liquidity, cut interest rates, and that in turn flows into the market. So to that extent, a global economic crisis leads to liquidity, gradually to Indian markets being higher. So to that extent, do not worry about the distress about the markets. Equities as an asset class is geared to perform whenever the economic growth is good, which you can say for the India that we are entering the golden decade for the next 10 years, I think high single digit to probably even low double digit returns and uh, GDP growth in some years can be expected. And hence, I would say that you should definitely continue with your investments in MF and equity with the qualification that if you need the money for a wedding, for a family, for a holiday, whatever you plan for, then you should definitely use that money for that and not just keep waiting, right? So, dear sir, what is the expected return if you stay in a particular mindset uh, for this? Well, well, the uh, I would say that you said 15-year horizon. So, look at it this way, right? I would say that a good equity fund in a 15-year horizon should deliver to you the nominal GDP growth plus 2 to 3 percent. So, India, if you see, I said high single digit, assume inflation will remain between a 4 to 6 percent band if RBI manages it. So, we are looking at a 12 to 14 percent nominal GDP growth over a 15-year time frame. And hence, uh, uh, a good fund manager should be able to deliver between 14 to 16 percent. But this will not happen as 14 to 16 percent every year. It could be a 5 percent, it could be minus 20 percent, it could be plus. So, I would say that exit plan, right? You should generally not want to exit a fund because when you do your research for the fund, I know if you will look at past performance of the fund. I'm not saying don't look at it, but look at the track record of the fund house. How long have they been in the Indian markets? Whether they've understood that the Indian economy goes through cyclicality and they managed it. As long as you are investing in the fund manager long track record, right? Your fund, which is performing well over the next five years, may not be that fund which is going to perform well over the 15 years. So I would say with a diversified mutual fund portfolio across fund houses and across types of schemes, you don't need to look at exiting funds. By and large, fund managers will do a good job. So just trust in the research process that you've put into before investing in the fund and then stay with it for 15 years is my recommendation, right? Should I invest in tax saver in MF? 
Well, definitely, if you are looking at it as a tax saving opportunity, the MFs are the, the best because you have the advantage of the capital market giving you returns in addition to the ATC tax benefit. So definitely tax saver MFs are a very good investment option uh, in comparison to P, uh, PPF or the other, other schemes that are available in the market over a longer term period, right? Your somebody says that I want to invest five lakh in SWP with SWP start out of one year, such as a good fund. When will you do double the amount? Well, if you're going to withdraw the money from a, a fund, how will it double, right? Because he's giving away the gains to you through SWP. So either you want to double your investment, then you stay invested. Don't pull out the money in SWP. But if you're pulling out through SWP, I would say choose any multi-cap or flexi-cap funds because they tend to perform Whenever large caps are performing, they will gain from it. Whenever mid caps or small caps, they'll gain from it. So a multi-cap or a flexi-cap fund is a good option. If your volatility uh, threshold is very low and your return expectation also is not so high, then you can look at the balance advantage fund or the aggressive hybrid funds, which have a certain amount of debt, but keep your expectations that much lower, but you will benefit from lesser volatility in these funds, right? So... So somebody says, uh, uh, next question on that is, glad uh, talking to you. My question is, if I'm investing 2000 per month for 10 years, can I, in the current market, you know, how can I see my growth in mutual fund investing? You see very good growth in your investment. If you're starting now and investing for 10 years, please do not worry. You can expect good double digit returns from your portfolio. Which is the performing suggest to suggest to investor? What is the best option to invest? Like I said, the performing fund need not be the future performing fund. So don't necessarily go only by past performance. I would chase, choose any fund managers with a track record. And you can generally, I would, like I said, choose the multi-cap, flexi-cap, large and mid-cap. These kind of products, which are a better bet because different on different economic cycles, they will perform, right? Uh, what is the best option to invest in present? The present conditions, given that I would expect volatility for the rest of the calendar year, I would say investing through a STP route, parking your money in a liquid fund, and then gradually over the next six to 12 months, investing it into the equities is the best option in the volatile scenario. Uh, in long-term basis, is it safe for investment and how much rate approximately after 20 years? In long-term basis, it is safe for investment. After 20 years, like I said, the past track record of the stock market says that you can get medium to high double-digit returns from the stock market. So why is NAV low since long? Even equity market is performing okay. Well, it depends on the kind of uh, portfolio allocation that's been there. Not all segments of the equity market have been performing. So funds with a higher allocation to the underperforming segments actually have not delivered those kind of returns. These are fund manager calls based on expectations. Sometimes they come right, sometimes they don't. So I think over a period, if you just wait long enough, they will get taken care of, right? Uh, PMS investments have gone up by almost 20% in the last few months. What's your advice? What would be the approximate profit amount can expect in a three-year duration? Well, PMS is a more high risk, high reward. So you can't say profit amount because in a three year time frame, you could have the volatility swing the other way. But generally, in a good time, PMS should deliver 200, 300 basis points more than mutual funds. But in a bad time, they can lose 200, 300 more than investment. So bear in mind that PMSs are generally higher risk than mutual funds because they give up one of the key strengths of mutual fund, which is diversification. So they go for concentration. Concentration works very well in good times but perhaps hurts in bad times. So to that extent, since I over the next three years, I do expect the economy to do well and the equity markets to do well. I think portfolio management investments should do better than mutual funds in the next three years. So if you're already invested in the PMS, I suggest you top up your investments in the current because all most PMSs are growth-oriented portfolios and growth has suffered in the recent fall. So it's a good time to buy more growth. From that perspective, somebody has invested uh, in, uh, I have invested in MF debt, low duration, short term and ultra short term, equity, hybrid, international balance. Yes, you have a very good diversified portfolio. Should I exit from debt funds though my investments in short or just in short term? No, please don't exit from the debt funds because if you're in short duration funds, as interest rates rises, the, the, the repricing uh, of the assets will take place and you will benefit. Bear in mind that your three-year lock-in will help you from a taxation perspective. So look at it whether you've already spent three years in that place. And if you're in short duration, I recommend that you can continue till the balance of the three years gets completed. Further, 
Is there a need to review and exit from equity funds currently preventing volatility? Not at all. The current volatility in the market is a liquidity driven volatility. It is not a growth driven volatility, but because liquidity has gone out from all segments, growth has suffered. So equity generally benefits from growth. So I would say that you would actually top up or double your SIPs in this period of volatility because buy low, sell high comes to good only when you buy when it's low and not panic and sell when it's low, right? So uh, lastly, somebody says, ask me, I've deferred all my further plans of investment in MF and kept the money in bank deposit. Decision is right. No, definitely it's not correct decision, I would say, because see, you're keeping it in a bank deposit, you know, at a rate at which the real rate that you get, right, is negative. Bank deposits are giving you what six to seven percent max. Inflation is six to seven in the retail level uh, CPI. But if you look at the actual inflation in various pockets, are much higher. So your bank deposits are actually eroding your wealth, right? Though the equity markets may have fallen in the near term, they can bounce back equally. But the bank deposit rate, once you put in the money in deposit, is fixed for the life of the deposit. So I would not recommend that you get frightened with the volatility and pull out your money. No, in fact, whenever there's volatility in a growth country like India, it's the time to double down on your investments and increase your allocation. That's what I would call a smart rupee cost averaging, which I would recommend that you do, right? So then finally, one more question is, mutual funds are best for lump sum investment as of today for one to two years midterm and long term with reasonable returns. No, and two MF best for SIPs. I think MFs are best for SIPs by and large for a retail investor. For lump sum investor, given the fact that I expect volatility over the next six months, I would generally not for a risk averse investor recommend lump sum. I would say stagger your lump sum over the next six months through STPs. Yeah. Where does mutual money stand in the face of falling markets, creating anxiety among small investors? Well, falling markets, I don't think that an expectation that a mutual fund will be able to post rising returns in a falling markets is a reasonable expectation. When markets fall, mutual fund investments will also fall. So I think to calm investors, the best way is to educate them. The question that we are doing is a part of this education process where you understand that the reason that the markets are falling is because of liquidity and not with economic distress in India. And because of that, when this current liquidity related volatility ends, the market will respect the economy and the markets will rise. Volatility is inherent nature of the market. And like I said a few minutes earlier, the smart investor is the one who will grab every opportunity in volatility to allocate a little more to the markets. Because then when the times become good, you would have made much better return from those who panicked and went away from the markets, right? Can I get 25% CHR in 10 years? Well, you can get, but will you get? I'm not guaranteeing that. You can get if Indian economy is in a sweet spot at the end of 10 years and everything has been fantastic. But 25% expectation is a very unrealistic expectation. And I don't think that you should make any investment with that kind of expectation. In some particular years, you may get 25% returns. In a particular three-year period, you may get 25% returns. But after that, it will tone itself down. So sustained 25% over 10 years CAGR is, is not something that you should have as a goal in mind when you invest. You may end up with it in a very rare kind of a scenario. How can I redeem my investments in a lock-in period? You cannot redeem your investments in your lock-in period. If it's a close-ended fund, sometimes it's traded in the exchange, you can try and find a buyer in the exchange. But otherwise, a tax-saving locking cannot be, you cannot uh, take it out. Which fund is a better return in 2022 in this volatile market? Please name this fund. I'm sorry, we can't predict the return of the fund in 2022 in this market. I think nobody is allowed to do that and it's not fair, the extent of volatility. So like I said, generally, if you want to protect yourself from volatility, be in the hybrid space, right? So there are funds like equity saving funds, balance advantage funds, aggressive hybrid funds. These are all things in a volatile scenario will perform better because their debt component will ease it and the equity volatility will be less in those schemes, right? So finally, we come to a section where people have specific questions about Sudaran Mutual Fund. And I think I have about uh, five minutes time to take those questions before we go to the live question. So let me take a shot at some of these. So somebody has asked me a question saying, options of investing in MFs, large cap, multi cap, mid cap, small cap. I've invested in Sundaram Blue Chip, large cap, mid cap, focused, but not performing well. Shall I redeem and go for fresh funds? Buy additional to compensate the losses? Please reply. Total portfolio, 5 lakhs. Well, the reason the recent underperformance is because our portfolios have been growth-oriented. So growth has suffered. So we expect growth to be sustained and the market to begin respecting growth when the current volatility ends. 
So to answer your question, no, this is not the time to redeem. It is the time for go for fresh allocations because you're buying low, selling high. So in this volatility, when growth is being punished, is the time to buy growth because then when growth is being rewarded, you would have put in much more money at a time when uh, it prices were low. So I would say that these are good funds that you have chosen and you should actually increase your allocation to these funds uh, over the next six months, right? Uh, minimum investment, so much in Sundaram MF, for as close as 100 rupees, you can make an investment in any scheme, most schemes of Sundaram MF, right? You can look at the uh, offer document or the website for each scheme wise details, but most of our schemes have 100 rupees as a minimum subscription amount. Uh, why are you people not launching bank nifty index fund? Well, essentially we are active fund managers and we believe that uh, active over the long term will beat passive. So we have not been one of those who's been actively launching passive funds. So I think that will continue. We might launch something what's known as smart beta products where we can, we can tilt the passive component to a more semi-active kind of a thing, which may come up in the future. But otherwise, we are a strong believer in the fact that active fund management over the medium term will be passive and are a better option for investors to invest in. Why, since 2017, I'm doing SIP in the mid cap fund, 10,000 per month. The fund is giving returns, but not expected. Explain your suggestion in this regard. Is it okay now to top up? Well, the fund went through a long period of an allocation to sectors which, in the COVID time, got hammered and hence it suffered. Subsequently, the fund managers have reallocated the portfolio. The fund has strongly improved in its performance levels, and it's a good time to invest more in the fund from a longer term. Since you have been an investor since 2017, I think it's, uh, it's, it's you know, with a 10-year horizon till 2027, definitely the fund will deliver very good returns for you. I had invested two and a half lakhs in Sundaram Blue Chip Fund in October and still holding. What are the prospects and give you available? Well, the Sundaram Blue Chip Fund is a large cap fund, as you know. And uh, in the large cap space, while the FIS have been selling in the large cap, the mutual funds have also been buying. And I think in the recent correction, large caps have corrected the least, mid and small caps have corrected more on the calendar year to date. So the fund has done reasonably well. And I would say continue to hold because in a volatile time, large caps tend to be more stable. So the fund will give you a good feel, good factor compared to mid cap or small cap fund. And when the the economy starts getting liquidity again from the US, again, fund managers will, FII fund managers will prefer large caps. And so you will see a rise. So I would say as an allocation to large cap, the blue chip is a good fund. Continue your holding. If need be, you can even top it up. Uh, why is Sundaram large and mid-cap return not as improved in the long term and medium term? Worried after transfer into fund by principal MF, principal blue chip was very excellent, so I was invested. Well, the same fund manager, Mr. Ravi Kopalakrishnan, continues to manage the merged fund. The merger has not affected the prospects. It's a growth-oriented portfolio which Ravi has taken, which is affected. And as I said in my answer to the other funds, the growth will get rewarded in a in a reasonably one to two year time frame, so I recommend continue your investment in the large and mid cap fund, and it will be a good allocation in your portfolio. Uh, effect of market slowdown on Sundaram aggressive health fund. I invested in Sundaram. Now the NAV is so low, my capital value is showing low. What to do? Well, I would presume that you have invested in the dividend option, and so because the dividend has been paid out, the NAV is low. So my thing is to look at the total return, including the dividend received by you and the NAV, which I'm sure will show that the fund has been performing reasonably well and is given a high single digit returns, which is what you can expect from the hybrid category, much better than the fixed deposit returns that were prevalent when you started investing. Uh, what is the ample time required in Sundar Mukta for stable returns? Well, uh, you can have good returns, but stability of returns is not something any fund manager or any equity manager can, can advise because market volatility will transcend into fund. So stable returns is not something that an equity MF is, uh, is supposed to deliver. It will deliver wealth creation to you over the long term as long as the economic growth is good. Short-term volatility will always be a factor of equity mutual funds. In many of the schemes of your funds on dividend declared, dividend payable is above 500 is this? Okay, you're saying that basically the TDS uh, is taking it uh, below 500 and is getting reinvested. I will take this up with our operations team and pass on your query to them to resolve this. Okay, so I think, and then finally, there's a set of questions uh, which uh, need your assertive growth perspective, monitoring sheet against investment growth. I'm not able to understand your question, sir. Maybe you can re-ask the question in the live session. I'm 79 plus and want a safe investment in 10% return. 
Well, sir, uh, the equity markets are not for people of your age in terms of safety of capital. I would say that, uh, uh, you know, you would be better off uh, investing with the help of an advisor. See, generally we say 100 minus age is the amount to be invested in equity. So at the age of 79, only 20% odd should be in equities. So I would say that the expectation of a 10% return is, is uh, not uh, something that currently the bank deposits are the best place for, to get assured returns and they are only at about six or seven. Senior citizen, you may get a little more at about seven, seven and a half. So I suggest that you be satisfied with that, sir, because equity markets may will give you 10% plus but in some years will give you negative. Assured returns are not something that mutual funds are in a position to give or regulatory allowed to give. Uh, so finally, I think with that, I think we'll come to the end of the questions and I will now uh, ask my team to uh, beam across and ask me any of the uh, live questions that have come on the scene. Sure. So, first question Is a multi asset capital fund, including gold, a better bet uh, in such volatile period? We should go for a multi cap fund because that uh, doesn't invest in gold. So, see, gold is a is a safety hedge. So when there's times of war, high inflation, hyperinflation, gold tends to do well. But also remember that gold is negatively correlated to the US dollar. So when the dollar becomes strong, gold becomes weak because gold money is float money, right? So wherever the safe haven. So dollar, when interest rates are rising, dollar is a safe haven, better than gold. So I would say that uh, your time perspective, right, in terms of this is what should decide and your risk tolerance, right? So in a multi-cap fund, you've got to be clear that you're of an aggressive risk mentality. Your uh, ability to take risk must be high. Whereas multi-asset funds are meant for a lower risk tolerance. So if your risk tolerance is of moderate or lower, then multi-asset funds are a better bet compared to multi-cap funds. The next one. While we address questions on the US recession and whether India is at the same rate, uh, GST collections are increasing month on month, but why is the market crashing? The market is crashing because, uh, uh, not because the Indian economy is not doing well, but because uh, emerging market funds are seeing outflows in the US and other countries. Why are they seeing outflows? Because people who are investing the money in emerging markets are worried about two things. One is some people borrow money, like margin trading here, borrow money to invest in equities. So their cost of borrowing goes up. So then their profit margin comes down, number one. Second aspect is that when uh, interest rates rise, US dollar strengthens. When dollar strengthens, emerging market economies, a currency weakens, India weakens. So then they face the risk that the currency depreciation of Indian rupee will hurt their returns. That's the second reason. The third reason is that for India, we are a very commodity import uh, oil. 85% of our oil is imported. Many portion of our wedding oil is imported a lot of so when oil prices rise indian economy tends to get hurt more indian companies eps tends to get hurt more so that's why fis would like to put their money into a commodity exporting country like a brazil or uh, some other country so that's why the indian market is suffering the impact of a liquidity withdrawal by fbis and not that somebody is panicking based on indian growth story whereas domestic fund managers are buying because domestic story is good so i think the answer lies in the fact that at this point in time flows are not respecting the indian growth but that cannot last forever sooner or later flows will support come in indian growth and you will see the markets rise so that's why uh, the current uh, gst collections which is the proxy for gst to gb gdp growth is not getting reflected in the markets but over the medium term i'm sure that the balance will get redressed the next question is it more relevant to buy or invest now in mutual funds as the downward direction of the same Yes. So mutual funds uh, bring you essentially two main advantages. So one is the advantage of diversification. Second is the advantage of expertise in terms of research and buying the right stocks or choosing the right sectors, right? So in a downward trending market is where fund managers who study companies get a lot of value because they see growth is available at a reasonable price. When the markets are rising, then every growth company's stocks price rises and is very hard to invest. So a falling market, like you said, is a very good time for a fund manager. If you give money to the fund manager for him to then go and buy the right stocks because they are now available at the right price. So I think that uh, investing in a downward scenario in mutual funds and because diversification is a national mantra, you are actually de-risking yourself from the bets 
that a fund manager will take. He cannot take all his bets on one company or two companies. He has to spread it across 30 to 40, 50, 60 companies. So that then protects you from any one call going not correct in the time frame that you have in mind and spreading your risk. So the risk reward equation improves tremendously in this falling market when you invest through a mutual fund. Next question. Flexible funds are not working well for the fund selection that for the fund managers gain. Any reason? Yes, because uh, FlexiCap funds, uh, uh, what they do is nobody expected the Russia-Ukraine war. So portfolios constructed before the war happened were essentially betting on a quick revival of growth and money, liquidity continuing in India and inflation being comfortable. The Russia-Ukraine crisis came and suddenly the whole uh, supply side inflation went up, global uncertainty went up, FIA money starting pulled out. Fund managers were unprepared for a black swan event like the russia ukraine war and hence those portfolios have reflected that. Now the fund manager in the process of correcting those portfolios, taking this war into consideration and they will come back strongly. But the reason was an unexpected event like the war. So fund managers who were essentially looking at the scenario and saying there's a good time for growth was suddenly got hammered because of the war. So I think it's more the unexpected situation of the war which led to a hurt in the flexi cap category. But I'm sure the reallocation happening now with the revised outlooks, they will all bounce back. Do large caps have a more inherent flexing in the compared to other taxes? Yes. In uh, because large caps such more stable, uh, say like I talked about FMCG a few minutes ago, right? Even in a in a downward economic trend, uh, toothpaste has still to be bought, right? So there's a greater resilience. Second, larger cap companies borrow less, so they are less volatile because interest costs are very low, so they don't have to pay out interest costs when things down. Third is that they are all very large companies and hence they have market share. So in a downtrend also, the smaller companies tend to go by the wayside or collapse or tend to get merged or bought by large cap. The large cap becomes stronger in a thing. So yes, the what you say is true. That is where the safety element of a large cap comes in, especially in a volatile or in a downtrend scenario. Do you offer equity advice based on the research in the fund uh, we have something called the portfolio management services where we do offer this. The minimum investment size there is determined by the regulator at 50 lakhs. So that benefit is available only to uh, uh, equity in, uh, investors in our portfolio management services, which is through our subsidiary company, Sudram Alternates Limited. But in the mutual fund, we do not generally offer individual advice to investors. In the present situation, uh, overseas equity investment fund performance is lower than Indian MX. What is your view on further investing in overseas funds? Well, one thing is there is that uh, the reason that uh, overseas funds have performed worse than Indian funds uh, is because in India, the markets have been supported by domestic flows and hence the fall hasn't been as great in the Indian stock market compared to the rest of the world. To that extent, uh, that's what is actually domestic investments have helped the push in the fall once one. Second, from an in overseas investment perspective, it's always good to have an allocation to overseas investment. So currently, because of the cap being breached, I think uh, very few fund houses are eligible to accept investments. Only from February 2nd, any redemptions to the direction they can expect. How you can probably invest directly through what is known as the LRMS scheme of the Reserve Bank of India in, in overseas instruments. It's always good to have an allocation because when the rupee weakens, the Indian investor benefits from overseas investments. So it's good to keep 5 to 10 percent of your allocation in international investments despite the fall that's happening there because by and large these are also good solid companies, good quality companies. Next question. How do you compare investment in land with MX over the Well, um, well, first of all, I'm not an expert on, uh, on land, but generally I will uh, give a clue that uh, when inflation is very high, real assets like land tend to do well. And uh, the current rates of inflation in India at about 6 to 7 percent CPI is not that very high. Second is the fact is that uh, uh, in uh, land investment, the holding period is very long, whereas, you know, in, in mutual funds after one year, you can always exit and re-enter when you want, when the taxation is very low. So otherwise, from a perspective, I would say that as a long-term inflation hedge, right, 
mutual funds offer you liquidity plus the hedge, whereas land doesn't have liquidity, but generally tends to rise with inflation, right? So I would leave that call, call for you to take. Does Sundar Mutual Fund invest in gold bonds? Uh, no, none of our current funds has the ability to invest in gold bonds. Next question. To build my own portfolio, how much percentage allocation do you suggest in mutual funds, equities, gold, debt funds, and property? My age is 41 years. So, uh, broadly, uh, the, your investment in equities should be about 60% of your portfolio given your age, right? And within that 60%, uh, I would say that uh, your allocation should be. Uh, what were the classes that he requested to get guidance on? Equities should be 60. So uh, I would say that 40% uh, should be in a debt uh, category, whether it's in debt funds or fixed deposits or savings bank account, you can choose that. And 60% in equity. And I would say uh, out of the 40% in debt, you can allocate about 10% to gold. Uh, uh, land, I would not be able to comment. Like I said, I'm not an expert on land. And the only thing that you also not provided is your holding period in terms of time frame. Because if it's a very short term time frame of one to two years, I would actually broad, bring down the equity to from 40 to say 25 to 30 percent and put it in uh, bank deposits or something like that. Because in the short run, there's going to be volatility in the markets. But if you have a horizon of three, five, or seven, 10 years, then 60 percent in equities is what I would recommend. Next question. Will it be helpful to stop taking dividends for a few months? Well, you don't have a choice in terms of stop taking dividends because once you're in a dividend option, if the fund manager declares a dividend, you have to take it. So I don't understand what you mean by stop taking dividends because dividend is generally controlled by the giver, not by the receiver. Next one. Uh, to buy a mutual fund, which is the best way to alleviate like ICICI or direct NFT? Well, I mean, uh, it all depends uh, when all the options are available, the convenience is there. But uh, generally, you know, if you are going to go through, you know, I say as a direct or grow or whatever, you can choose multiple mutual funds from multiple fund houses at a single entry into the you know computer. Whereas if you go to individually direct investing, you'll have to go to each fund house to make that investment. So depending on the time on your hand and the research that you do, plus again, these, these uh, distributors also provide you multiple levels of information, which saves you the time and trouble of doing. So I think that uh, using these platforms is a good, uh, good methodology because it saves you a lot of time and effort. What's your advice about similar services fund? Please tell us the horizon for good reasons. So the services fund is essentially a services sector fund. And the services sector fund carries two main qualifications. So one is that it's more than half of India's GDP, but it's only one third of India's stock market. So we believe that over a period of time, the market has to respect the economy. And hence, the stock market share of services sector will go up gradually from 36 to the 54 that is as a share of the economy. So we believe that the market capitalization of services-oriented companies, new companies coming in, will tremendously widen. Second aspect is that the service sector also has a recession-proof element to it to the extent that some services are exported, some services are domestically consumed. So it has a benefit, like IT is an export-oriented sector, whereas banking is a domestic service, so both of which form a big part. The third growth factor on the services thing is that India has entered a sweet spot of just crossing $2,000 per capita GDP. And countries which do that see a tremendous retail explosion over the next decade. And their GDP per capita goes from, say, 2000 to 7, 8, or 10,000 over the next decade. Such times, right, is the retail services segment which will outperform. So to that extent, I would say to have a three to five year outlook on the services sector would help you to get very good returns on the market. What is your view for concession or extension available to senior citizens in the near future on their investments? Uh, well, um, uh, I, this is the answer question to the government of India. Right now, they offer these concessions you know, both in terms of a taxation and bonds of a higher interest on FDs. But as far as mutual funds are concerned, I don't think uh, I hear of any plan of the government to give concession to senior citizens in mutual fund investments. So your questions are best directed at the Ministry of Finance or you know, whoever there is. Next question. Uh, what is your view on the 
Thank you very much. And it was perfectly timed. We're just three minutes short of the hour in terms of our question hour. Thank you very much. It's been a very engaging question, session with a lot of good questions. And I hope these answers have helped gone some way towards helping ease your concerns around the present condition of the stock markets. Look forward to meeting with you on my next question hour session and wishing you all the very best in your investing in the coming weeks. Thank you and goodbye.